Good evening and a very warm welcome to the Institute for Advanced Study. And it is my pleasure today to introduce the, this year's STD lecturer in historical studies, Ulrich Marzolf, who is professor of Islamic studies at the Georg August University in Göttingen, Germany, and a senior member of the editorial committee of the Encyclopedie des Märchens, a research and publishing institution at the Academy of Sciences in Göttingen that began in 86 and was concluded in 2015. Having studied Islamic studies, Chinese and Roman studies at the University of Cologne in Germany and Mashhad, Iran, Ulrich Marzolf is a world leading specialist in the narrative culture of the Middle East that links to both visual culture and the history of printing. He has published widely in all the relevant areas. Special mention should be made of his study of the jocular tales in pre-modern a pre-Mongol Arabic literature that was published in 92, his monograph of 2001, Narrative Illustration in Persian Lithograph Books, and a series of books devoted to the Arabian Nights, among them the Arabian Nights Encyclopedia was, was published in 2004, his numerous publications on the modern Iranian martyr murals, as well as his most recent monograph that was published this year, Relief of the Hardship, the Ottoman Turkish Model for the uh, 2001 Days. At present, Ulrich Marzolf is engaged in two major research projects, which again touch upon oral, print, and visual culture, namely the Orient Within Us, narratives from the Muslim world in, European, in the European oral tradition, and an analytical assessment of the complete production of the main artists of lithograph illustration in Persian books in the Qajar uh, period, that is 19th century, Mirza Ali Kuli Khui. Today's talk, The Visual Culture of Iranian Twelver Shiism in the Qajar period, is based on some of his most recent research. In addition to this, his talk is also immediately relevant to the Shi Studies research program that is currently being pursued here at the IAS. The principal motive being to bring to the forefront a central part of Islamic studies that which has no structural academic underpinning neither here in the US or in Canada nor in Europe. As a part of this endeavor, we have gathered here at present an impressive group of some 30 scholars who work on a variety of aspects of Shi studies. And today's STD lecture by Ulrich Marzol fits perfectly into the thematic concerns of the conference. Before, before passing the word to Professor Matzolf, let me end by thanking Dr. S. T. Lee, who generously endowed the S. T. Lee Fund for Historical Studies, which allows us to hold a public annual lecture to showcase fields which are studied here at the School of Historical Studies. Thanks also due to the Carnegie for Corporation of New York for, for generously funding the Shi Studies Research Project. Now, without further ado, I leave the floor to Professor Matzolf. Everybody, uh, thank you very much, Sabina, for this kind and very generous introduction, and particularly for asking me to deliver the prestigious STD lecture. Um, actually, uh, arriving in Princeton, it came to my mind that I'm probably the one person in this room who knows you for the longest period of time. Uh, um, not many people might realize this connection, but if I remember correctly, you learned the first steps of Arabic uh, in, well, so many years ago that it almost seems like a different life. Uh, I'm very happy that you made a very good, very prestigious career, and I'm very happy to see you here. So uh, let me start my lecture on the visual culture of Iranian well, the Shiism in the Qajar period. Um, I just want to figure out how this works. Oh, okay. From the rock reliefs of Sasanian Iran and the frescoes at the ancient Sakhtin site of Panjikent in present-day Tajikistan, 
to modern posters and the ubiquitous murals in contemporary Tehran, Iranian culture has always practiced a distinctly liberal approach to the visual representation of the human being. Although discussions of visual culture in the Muslim world invariably link to the debate about the alleged ban on images in Islam, this feature never affected Iranian art of the Muslim period in a decisive manner. To the contrary, for many centuries, Iranian artists collaborated in the creation of profusely illustrated manuscripts, particularly of the Iranian national epic, Firdosi Shahnameh, or Book of Kings. When the Safavid rulers established 12 Shiism as the official creed in Iran at the beginning of the 16th century, this move also resulted in intensifying the oral and visual representation of the master narrative that lies at the basis of Iran's religious identity. As new means of visual representation were introduced in 19th century Qadda Iran, the period was fashioned into an era of heightened picture making and the visual presence of Shi'i themes and topics reached an unprecedented abundance. The constant repetition of specific scenes, such as the touching image of Imam Hussein and his infant son Ali Asghar, anchored these scenes firmly in popular consciousness as popular artists translated them visually into wall paintings, tile work, reverse paintings on glass, single sheet prints offered at places of worship, illustrated lithograph books, and the canvases of popular storytellers that told and retold the same stories time and again. In the following, I propose to introduce you to the visual culture of Iranian 12 Shi'ism in the Qadda period. The study of Shi'i visual culture is a recent branch of the still fairly young field of Shi'i studies. Over the past 30 years, Iranian author Hadi Saif has published an impressive number of richly illustrated books on various pertinent fields of Iranian popular art. Scholars such as Maria Vittoria Fontana, Mehr Ali Levi, Ingvild Flaskeroth, and James Allen produced focus studies, while Hijam Khosronejad and Fahmide Suleiman each published important collective volumes. Based on my own experience as a researcher of Iranian popular culture and literature, it is my contention that the visualization of the Shi'i creed's foundational narrative and images served less to express a pre-existing popular piety instead to a considerable extent contributing to its very generation. Supported by the appeal of images that translate the emotional narratives of early Shi'i history into a powerful visual experience, popular piety in its turn made a notable contribution to the firm establishment of the 12 Shi'i creed, whose role in recent political developments in Iran should not be underestimated. Before sketching the history of Shi'i visual culture in the Qajar period and discussing its major features, features, a short note on terminology is in order. Visual culture is my preferred term for a field of studies that historians of Islamic art label pictorial art, as it mainly concerns the artistic representation of images or pictures. My argument for favoring the term visual culture is twofold. First, the latter term encompasses items of visual representation that art historians do not necessarily regard as art. Instead, due to their embeddedness in popular context, relegating them to the field of ethnography. And second, the term visual culture emphasizes the phenomenon as being part of a cultural process. In other words, Pictorial art stresses the terms, uh, the, the items, artistic qualities, and static existence, whereas visual culture emphasizes the dynamics of production and reception in a web of tradition that encompasses much more than just pictures. The Shia is originally the Shi'at Ali, or party of Ali. Consequently, Shia visual culture is closely connected to the person and the progeny of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali is not only the Prophet Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, 
but moreover the one person whom the Shia regards as the Prophet's only legitimate successor and the first Imam or leader of the Shia community. The narrative cosmos of the Shia community is ruled by its pivotal trauma, the violent death or martyrdom of the Prophet Muhammad's grandson and the Shia's third Imam, Hussein, an event that took place during the Battle of Karbala on the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura in the year 680. Hussein's suffering and death is considered by the Shi'i community as the greatest act of suffering and redemption in history. For them, it transcends history, acquiring cosmic proportions. As Hussein's passion acquires a unique position between time, beyond time and place, every day becomes Ashura, and every place becomes Karbala. Shi'i visual culture stages the gruesome events at Karbala in a particular aesthetics of violence against the oppressed, detailing the cruelty against the members of the Shi'i company in a manner that, for the uninitiated, needs getting used to. The martyrdom of Hussein and his companions is framed by two distinct, by two distinct features. On the one side, there is the veneration of Hussein's father Ali and the Shia holy family. On the other, there is the aftermath of Karbala and the Shi'i insurgent Muhtar as sahafi avenging the martyrs of Karbala with its morbid iconography of the tortures which he inflicted on Imam Hussein's murders. Visually of secondary importance, although not ideologically, a certain attention is devoted to the fate of the descendants of Hussein's only surviving son, Ali Hussein al Abidin, in particular the imams of the 12th Shia, whose lineage ended with the greater occultation of the 12th Imam, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Mahdi, in the year 941. The gradual development of Shi'i visual culture from the Safawi to the Qajar period can be traced relatively clearly. In the Timuri period, Ali had still been celebrated as one of the orthodox caliphs. It was only towards the end of the 15th century that his role was gradually revised to being the first Shi'i Imam, the hero of the Shi'i community. An early monument of Shi'i visual culture is Ibn Hussam's late 15th century Khawaran Nama, a largely fictional narrative that celebrates the prowess of Ali and his companions together with a visual program of more than 150 illustrations. Highly influential in the long run was the book Rosa to Shohada, The Meadow of Martyrs, written at the beginning of the 16th century by Mullah Hussein Wa'iz Kashifi. In the West, this productive author has been known since the 19th century mainly for his book Anwar Suheili, the Lights of Amir Suheili, a Persian adaptation of the influential Arabic collection of fables, Kalila Wadimna. Kashifi's Rosa to Shohada is an Alid martyrology in 10 chapters and a conclusion, which focuses largely on Imam Hussein and the tragic events at Karbala. Originally written upon the demand of a Timuri prince and thus being a courtly literary production, the book soon became popular with the general audience. Although not the first of its kind, it reinforced the establishment of the Shi'i creed as propagated by the Safawi dynasty by modeling Hussein's martyrdom as the pivotal event of Shi'i history. In its capacity to define Shi'i identity, this event can hardly be rivaled as it combines the grief over the tragic death of the Chi Shi'i community's third Imam with an emotionally equally strong feeling of indelible guilt arising from the fact that the community of Hussein's partisans in Kufa had not come to his support as promised. Already in the Safavi period, the commemoration of the tragic events at Karbala resulted in public recitations of Kashifi's Rosa to Shuhada during the month of Muharram, known as Rose Khani. These recitations continued throughout the Qajar period, eventually initiating the genre of Rose Khani <laughs> literature. In addition, the remorse for Hussein's death found its public ex expression in mourning processions 
in which emotionally engaged participants would chastise themselves by beating their breasts or flagellating their backs with chains. Shortly before, or in the early days of the Khanja period, and likely initially in the city of Shiraz, the mourning processions merged with the stationary recitation into the dramatic performance of Ta'aziye, a word that literally means condolence, and that has come to be known as the Persian Passion Play. Both the Rozekhani and the Ta'aziye <coughs> were often performed for large audiences and developed into a major form of popular entertainment. In private houses, the Ta'aziye was at times enacted as a so-called Duhozi, as it was performed on a platform installed above the central pool, the hose, that was a standard feature of the large inner courtyards. Public buildings dedicated to this end are known as tekye. Some of them, uh, such as the tekye Dolat, the state tekye in Tehran, would host extremely large audiences. Another type of commemorative building was the Hosseiniye, the name of this building explicitly referring to its purpose of being dedicated to the remembrance of Hossein's martyrdom. While the Rose Khan, the verbal performer of the narrative, would routinely recite from a pulpit, the genre also gave rise to the performance of itinerant popular storytellers who would recite in public spaces such as the bazaar. Their performance, known as Pardekhani or Pardedari, was often accompanied by a visual aid in the form of a large canvas, a parde, that depicted the narrated events in a chronological or cumulative manner. Similarly, large tile panels in the places of worship and commemoration would depict single scenes from the narrated events or accumulate the scenes to form impressive visual representations. Wall paintings and tile panels of a similar nature are also displayed in the numerous sanctuaries for descendants of the Shi'i Imams, a building, type of building that is called the Imam Zadeh, or in sanctuaries for other venerated persons, buildings known as Bo'e. In Khaja, Iran, the visual proliferation of Shi'i themes was further reinforced by the introduction of printing that fostered a growing prominence of Shi'i themes on both narrative and visual levels. The first books printed in Iran from movable type include a fair number of items directed at scholars of theology, particularly the fundamental works of the 17th century author Muhammad Bakar Majlisi, thus substantiating a conscious promotion of Shi'i religious sentiment in Kaja Iran. Concurrently, lithographed books of the period addressing popular piety comprise a steadily growing number of 19th century compilations of the Rozehani genre. The titles of these books, such as Anwar as Shahada, The Lights of Martyrdom, Asrar as Shahada, The Secrets of Martyrdom, Ganjinege Asrar, The Treasury of Secrets, or Matam Kade, The Place of Mourning, are as much program as they are a constant appeal. With a different focus, albeit with a similar intention of furthering Shi'i popular piety, books like Hamle Ge The Lion's Attack, or Iftikhar Name Ye The Praise, The Book and Praise of the Lion, strove to enhance the veneration of Ali, whose popular epithet was God's Lion, Asadullah in Arabic, Shir Khoda, or Haydar in Persian. Whereas the Rosa to Shohada, the work that gave rise to the genre, was never published in an illustrated edition in the Kaja period, the lithographed editions of many of the books of Rosa Khani were adorned with illustration. Constituting the most often produced representative of the genre, Johari's Tufan al Bukha, The Deluge of Tears, was published in more than 50 editions. Contrasting with the relatively complicated, costly, and time-consuming process of preparing illustrations on tile work or on canvas, lithographed illustrations were line drawings in black ink, each of which at the very most might have taken a few hours to prepare. At least in the early phases of lithographic printing in Iran, the relative ease with which these illustrations could be produced resulted in a considerable growth of their thematic range. 
At the same time, the repetitive illustration of specific scenes in a large variety of topically related works codified the scene's iconography that had to a certain extent already been standardized in popular imagery prior <laughs> to the introduction of Xinjiang to Iran. Now, following this pretty much condensed survey of the history and genres of Shi'i visual culture in the Qajar period, I now suggest to have a closer look at a few selected items. The reading of these items requires a particular kind of visual literacy needed to correctly decipher a visual language consisting of a repertoire of signs whose vocabulary includes physiognomics, attributes, gesture, dress, color, surroundings, and milieu. In the indigenous context, this literacy would rarely have been gained by formal education, but rather by experience. Being constantly exposed to the same images with identical iconographical features in a variety of media, members of a pious Shi'i Shi -E audience in the Qajar period would have acquired the literacy to decipher the images, enabling them to link the visual representation of specific characters and scenes to specific narratives. Let me begin with a detailed discussion of what appears to be the oldest preserved canvas of a popular storyteller. This canvas probably dates from the Zand period. It is roughly the second half of the 18th century or just before the beginning of the Qajar period. The large canvas presents a cumulative depiction of well-known events during the Battle of Kerbala that the storyteller would have referred to while alerting the attention of his audience to the relevant image. The canvas is horizontally divided into three sections, each of which occupies roughly one third of the available space. While the narrow upper section depicts more or less a single scene, both the middle and the lower section contain three scenes each. The single images are not clearly framed, the sketchy backgrounds probably suggesting the barren desert landscape at Kerbala. The middle section is exclusively occupied with battle scenes, as is the left half of the lower section. Hossein is the only character appearing in each of the three sections. Considering the chronology of events, there is no clear direction how to read the canvas neither vertically nor horizontally. I suggest to dis discuss the images according to the commonly accepted sequence of events. In addition to iconographical features, the major characters are identified by their names written to their side. The Shi'i characters are further specified by a halo emanating from their head. Chronologically, the first battle is that on the left side of the middle section, depicting Hussein's nephew Qasim as he seizes the elder son of the Syrian warrior Azrakh by the hair and drags him around the battlefield. Qasim is particularly mourned since the beautiful young man had actually been scheduled to marry Hussein's daughter Fatima on the day he died in battle. Next comes the image on the left side of the lower section showing Hossein's half-brother Abu al-Fazi Abbas as he fights his way through the enemy army. Over his shoulder, he carries the water skin with which he intends to fetch water from the river to quench the thirst of the Shi'i company's children. The particularly scene depicted is the one where Abu al-Fazl demonstrates his prowess by slicing the enemy soldier Marid ibn Sodeif in two halves with a single blow of his sword. With identical features, this scene was later chosen as the central image in many of the large canvases prepared for popular storytellers. As the modern storyteller Moshid Rajab Ali Sarafi explains, Abbas is the embodiment <laughs> of physical strength, and his image serves as an allegory to visualize the determination of the Shi'i warriors. The person hiding in ambush in the little date palm grove on the left side is Hak Hakim ibn Tufay, the enemy warrior who is to cut off Abul Fazl's left arm as the latter is trying to force his way back to the encampment. Chronologically following 
is the image on the right side of the second section depicting Hossein's son Ali Akbar attacking the enemy army. Having introduced the most valiant Shi'i heroes, the remaining images of the canvas are devoted to Hussein, who is identified by his Lahab Abu Abdullah. The image in the upper section shows the Shi'i encampment, the Khayme Gah, with a small group of wailing women on the right side. On the left, there is the overwhelmingly large army, uh, large enemy army, led by Caliph Yazid's general Omar ibn Sa'd. In the center, we see Hussein holding his infant son Ali Asghar in his left arm while pensively resting his head against the lance he has put to the ground with his right hand. He is talking to a dervish, offering his help. At some distance to Hussein is the enemy soldier Harmale, that is Harmala ibn Kahil al-Asadi, who has just shot an arrow with which he kills Hussein's infant son. Right in the middle of the canvas is Hussein again, this time valiantly attacking the enemies. Already heavily wounded by several arrows sticking in his body, he appears a third time on the lower right, preparing himself for the final confrontation. The depicted scene relates to a legend according to which Hussein, actually many centuries later, appears to the Shi'i Mongol ruler Qais in India. When attacked by a lion, that ruler implored Hussein's help, uh, and the archangel Gabriel fetches Hussein from the battle at Kerbala, and the lion immediately bows to him. The last image in the lower section shows Hussein just before his death, as an angel consoles him, offering a drink of water in a small vessel. Exhausted, Hussein sits on the ground. with two of the enemy soldiers plotting his death at his back. One of them is identified as Shemr, that is Shemr ibn Dil Jaushan, who is about to kill Hussein with his dagger. And the second enemy soldier is Sinan, that is Sinan ibn As Anas and Nahai, the one who later severs Hussein's head to bring back to the caliph as a trophy. The images on the old canvas are all together imbued with a strong and valiant spirit. Neither the mutilation of Abu al-Fazl, both of whose arms were cut off during his attempt to bring the water skin back to the Shi'i encampment, nor the latest standard scene of Hussein consoling his dying son, Ali Akbar, are shown. Although the storytellers certainly elaborated the various deaths of the Shi'i heroes in their oral performance, the visual imagery of the canvas prefers to depict them as brave warriors. Rather than mourning their fateful death, the canvas thus conveys a spirit of bravery in the face of a certain defeat. The only character whose imminent death is visually detailed is Hussein. Pleading mercy, mercy not for himself, but only for his infant child, he faces the destiny that has invariably been decreed for him. In this manner, the canvas's atmosphere bespeaks a spirit of reassurance and self-confidence. In terms of artistic execution, particularly concerning the unrefined background design, the canvas betrays a certain relation to the wall paintings in Shi'i sanctuaries that have been extensively documented for the northern Iranian province of Gilan. These wall paintings are usually executed in a simple style. Essentially, they demonstrate an overlapping range of characters and events, including the battle scenes involving Qasim, Abu al-Fazl, and Ali Akbar, and of course the scene of Hussein holding Ali Asghar in his arm. In addition, however, the wall paintings add images of the hereafter that in the Qajar period became a standard feature of both tilework and the storyteller's canvases. These images demonstrate the drastic consequences of evil deeds and, although not documented here, the rewards of a meritorious life. They show a line of deceased people crossing the narrow bridge, the Pole Serat, 
some of them wearing their shroud and others being nude. As their deeds are being evaluated by a devil and an angel with the scale of justice, those whose evil deeds prevail fall from the bridge into an abyss filled with snakes and hideous dragon-like creatures that devour them. On the canvases of storytellers, this particular scene is often detailed, whether as a section of larger accumulated items or on items devoted solely to this theme. Whereas the limited space on the accumulated canvases only allows a glimpse into heaven and hell, specific canvases go into considerable detail. On the Day of Judgment, we see the dead rise from their graves and being arranged according to their relative merits. The ones who have committed evil deeds are designated as usurers and unspecific sinners. Although the sinners appear to go directly to hell with their heads chained together, their deeds are first evaluated by an angel with a large scale. The righteous appear, uh, also appear in several groups of which the prophets and the martyrs of Kerbala are specified, the latter holding their severed hands in their heads in their hands. On the upper right side of the image, a person from the prophet's family appears on the scene riding a camel and escorted by angels. This is probably the Imam al-Mahdi who is predicted to return on the Day of Judgment. The whole scene is presided over by three male characters, likely those most revered by Shi'i Islam, namely the Prophet Muhammad, Ali, and Hussein, the three of them standing on the steps of a pulpit. All of the deceased persons are made to pass over the narrow bridge. Again, those whose evil deeds prevail will fall into the abyss of hell, where they are tortured by the guardians of hell or devoured by the hideous dragon-like creatures. Those who have led a pious life are promised to enter paradise that is represented as a lush green lawn. In a tree next to the paradisal spring or well of water, the Tawsat, we see the bird of peace. The person sitting on the ground left of the spring on a shallow platform is either the Prophet Muhammad or Hussein, and the person standing on the right, still wearing his armor, is Hur ibn Yazid at the Yahi. Hur is the Caliph Yazid's army commander who switched sides during the Battle of Kerbala, joining Hussein and his companions in their fight against the Caliph's troops who died as a martyr, and hence is considered to be the first person to enter paradise. Hur represents the model Shi'i believer as he not only converted to the Shi'i creed because he was convinced of Hussein's just cause, but also because he sacrificed his life defending the Shi'i community. In this manner, the like images do not just present a vision of the Day of Judgment, but a vision that is deeply steeped in Shi'i belief. Whereas the scenes of reward and punishment are not specifically Shi'i, the presence of the martyrs the Mahdi and of Hur ibn Yazid in paradise add a specific Shi'i dimension. The implied message of martyrdom as a true believer's destiny is even more outspoken in those images that link the depiction of heaven and hell to the events at the Battle of Kerbala. In addition to the canvases of popular storytellers, two large tile panels on commemorative buildings in Shiraz share this imagery together with a depiction of the Day of Judgment. Now, the tile panel in the Hosseini Yeya Moshir, unfortunately, is not there anymore because it has been destroyed by fire. But the tile panel in the Imam Zadeh Ibrahim is still in place. Both panels present essentially the same imagery, differing only in detail. As the available images for the latter, the Imam Zadeh Ibrahim, are now much clearer, I will focus on them. The panel is divided into two large section, sections. The upper section inside a semicircular arch depicts the Day of Judgment in a similar manner as already discussed. 
The most noteworthy feature is the depiction of four martyrs standing on the upper right side, again defined by their bloody bodies and their severed heads. The, woman, uh, the women on the far right side hold items that are also related to martyrdom. One of them holds the infant Ali Asrar in her bosom, another one displays, displays Hussein's bloody shirt, and yet another one raises one of Abul Fazl's cut-off arms into the air. The tile panel's lower section contains a band of separated scenes. From left to right, the scenes depict the enemy army, Abul Fazl valiantly fighting his way to the river, Hussein pensively leaning on his lance while discussing with the dervish, Hussein trying to protect his nephew Qasim. Hussein consoling his son Ali Akbar, who is dying in his lap. And Hussein taking leave of his family while holding his infant son Ali Asghar in his arm. Although the images depict more or less the usual array of prominent characters, their emphasis differs from that of the storyteller's canvas. Whereas the canvas had celebrated all four major characters, including Qasim, Abul Fazl, Ali Akbar, and even Hussein, for their bravery in battle, now Abul Fazl is the only one portrayed as a valiant hero. Qasim and Ali Akbar have already been defeated and about, are about to die, and Hussein himself is reduced to his role of quintessential martyr who mourns the death of his beloved ones but sees no other way but to fulfill his decreed destiny. This shift of emphasis is likely not coincidental, as it is also a prominent feature on many of the contemporary canvases of storytellers that place Abul Fazl as a valiant hero in center image and frame him with various other scenes, the most prominent one being the scene of Hussein consoling his dying son, Ali Akbar. Although the storytellers' canvases often present a dazzling variety of consecutively occurring events, their essential message thus boils down to emphasizing the role of two characters. Whereas it was Hussein's destiny to lament the passing of his beloved ones before facing his own destiny, it was Abul Fazl's to die as a valiant warrior who would be admired for his selflessness, chivalry, and devotion. As the standard bearer of the Shi'i company, Abul Fazl is celebrated in various forms of popular images, including wall paintings and reverse paintings in glass. He is stereotypically depicted on tilework images attached to the public wells or fountains known as Saqqa Khane, whose creation has often been sponsored by pious Shi'is to ensure that no one could ever suffer Again, thirst to the degree the participants of the Battle of Karbala were forced to endure. A small series of tile panels in the Imamzade Sayyid Tajuddin Qarib in Shiraz even illustrates Abul Fazl's feat of fetching water from the river in four different scenes, avoiding, however, to show his eventual defeat and death. The manner Abul Fazl is portrayed again underlines the roles of the two prominent characters. Although all of the companions at Karbala experience the same fate, Hussein is the quintessential martyr, the Sayyid as Shuhada. Abul Fazl, to the contrary, is celebrated as the Qamar Bani Hashem, the moon of the tribe of Hashem, the pride and glory of the Shi'i company, the quintessential warrior. So far, the preceding discussion has focused on Shi'i visual culture in the public space. Less available to the public, but equally influential in shaping Shi'i visual culture were the illustrations in the lithographed Rosikhani books of the Qajar period. Of these already mentioned, Johari's Tufan al Boka is the most prominent one. The book's visual program was defined by the prominent artist Mirza Ali Quli Khoui, whose illustrations adorn roughly a quarter of the editions, notably those that were published in the early days of printing in Iran. 
The book's first illustrated edition, dating from 1848, has been profusely illustrated with almost 50 images. These images include many scenes that have rarely been illustrated otherwise, whether before or after, such as the birth of Hussein. In the following editions, the book's visual program was constantly diminished, averaging some 20 illustrations per edition. Particularly in the editions whose text was printed from movable type, the number of illustrations was further boiled down so that the Battle of Karbala appears in about four images only, including the fights, again, of Hor ibn Yazid and Qasim, Abu al-Fazl and Ali Akbar. Stressing the valiant side of Shi'i history, the book's narrative also <laughs> dwells on Ali's prowess. This is most notably visualized in the image of Ali's fight with Marhaba Khaybari, when angels have to control the power of his blow and protect the earth, lest he cut it in two halves as his sword effortly, effortlessly slices through the enemy's body. Johari's Tufan al-Bukhar was popular reading matter in the Qajar period. Although lithograph books were published in limited print runs of 300 to 400 copies, they often served multiple readers and would reach a large audience by being read out aloud in pious gatherings. In these situations, the book's large illustrations might probably have been shown around, serving as a further medium to solidify the audience's mental image of the Shi'i heroes fighting at Karbala and their valiant battle for the just cause of Shi'i Islam. Although the Karbala paradigm was the most influential source of inspiration for Shi'i visual culture of the Qajar period, it was, that should be mentioned, by no means the only one. <coughs> Innumerable images celebrate the Shi'i holy family that comprises the Prophet Muhammad, his daughter Fatima, his cousin and son-in-law Ali, and his grandsons Hassan and Hussein, the latter commonly known as Hassanain, the two Hassans. These five people are designated as either Ahle Bayt, the people of the Prophet's house, Ale Abba, the family of the cloak, referring to a scene where the prophet took them under his cloak, or simply as Pan Tan, the five venerated characters. In its most complete form, such as shown on this lacquer images, the portrayal would also include the historical characters, Salman al-Farisi, allegedly the first Iranian to convert to Islam here on the left, and Ali's faithful servant, Khanbar, usually clad as a dervish of the Naqshbandi order on the right. From popular paintings on walls or on the reverse side of glass, to elite paintings in lacquer work and large tile panels in the public space, hardly any single image in the Shi'i world is as popular as that of Ali and his two sons, again, often together with Salman and Khanbar. A scene that holds a specific value for the Shi'i community is the Prophet Muhammad's designation of Ali as his successor during the return from his last pilgrimage. This scene also appears in lithograph books of the period, as do, again, numerous illustrations testifying to Ali's superior status and prowess in battle. The most peculiar one of the latter ones is probably the image in which Ali rips an attacking dragon in two halves when still an infant in the cradle. And finally, the Prophet Muhammad's daughter Fatima, the mother of his only surviving male progeny, is also celebrated in Shi'i visual culture, here shown in a lithographed illustration to a popular narrative that serves to demonstrate Fatima's superior status as a social underdog beloved by God. In conclusion, let me return to the initial definition of Shi'i visual culture. Although the pivotal trauma of Karbala, together with its violent battles and cruel deaths, rules much of Shi'i imagery, Shi'i visual culture is 
more than just Kerbala. The unifying thread between the traumatic experience of Kerbala and the exalted veneration for Ali, his family and his descendants, is the historical experience of the Shi'i community. The central pillar of Shi'i consciousness is the fact that Ali and the Prophet's progeny, particularly his male descendants, were denied to fulfill the role as leaders of the Muslim community they were entitled to. When Shi'i Muslims of the Qajar period, and probably still today, would in the aftermath of the pilgrimage to Mecca visit the oasis of Fadak in the vicinity of Medina, they would do so with the fact in mind that Fatima was, was deprived of the revenue of the oasis's date palms, although it constituted part of her legal heritage. The Shi'i community regards this as an act of injustice that is part of a long series of oppressive acts that later involve the violent deaths of most of the Shi'i Imams. The series culminated in Karbala, but it neither starts nor ends there. The permanent remembrance of the perceived historical injustice is as much a cornerstone of Shi'i identity as is the veneration of its revered characters, both of which find their powerful expression in Shi'i visual culture. Finally, as Shi'i visual culture of the Qajar period is tantamount to Iranian visual culture, let me mention again a peculiar feature that is likely to amaze a non-Shi'i and particularly a Western audience. Iranians, I dare say, are proud of their aesthetic sensibility and the celebration of beauty since times immemorial. Combined with the experience of Karbala, this sensation results in the contradictory portrayal of cruelty and gruesome death in aesthetically appealing ways, resulting in lively colored and carefully structured compositions. And yet pious Shi'is of the Qajar period would apparently not have perceived these features as antithetic since both belong to Iran's historical legacy and both interact in perfectly natural ways. That said, I would like to conclude my presentation with an image that, although it dates from the late 1960s, aims to express Shi'i sentiment in an unambiguously beautiful manner. This as a tile panel illustrating the Prophet Muhammad's utterance that he himself is the city of knowledge, while Ali is its gate. Here staged in pseudo Qajar aesthetics, it is one of several ways to express the Shi'i community's basic understanding that Muhammad himself designated Ali as his successor, as Ali is the model human being whose perfection is second only to the Prophet of Islam. Thank you for your attention.